My name is Alexei Titarenko. I was born in St. Petersburg, and that is where I live. I have been photographing St. Petersburg since I was eight years old. In fact, I have devoted my entire life's work to this city. The history of my city, as well as the history of Russia in these past 20 years, are reflected in the photographs I take. Through the prism of my native city, I attempt to show events which occurred not only here, but throughout the country. The changes, the catastrophes, and the human tragedies which have swept the city and the people of this land. An artist, a photographer for example, is filled with ideas he carries around with him without knowing what they look like. The act of creation consists in making these ideas visible to others. In my case, the process occurs when I stroll about the city like this. I walk along and suddenly something catches my eye. I find myself looking at what I was seeking. I myself was born on a small industrial street on Vasilyevsky Island, in a house like this one, looking out on a maze of inner courtyards, crisscrossed from dawn until dusk by crowds of workers whose paths led along 24th Street on Vasilyevsky Island. Today, the scenes I observe mingle naturally with my childhood memories. Whenever I am especially struck by the sight of a building, or an event in a courtyard, or a cityscape, it is because it touches something buried deep inside me, related to my childhood memories. This type of feeling is a gauge of authenticity for me and it is what drives me to capture the image on film. My parents and I live in a communal apartment. The five of us had one small room for ourselves and to keep me from bothering the others in the morning, Every evening, my parents used to give me a book to read when I woke up in the morning. As a result, by the time I was seven or eight years old, I read quite a bit, and the literature had fueled my imagination. I enjoyed going for a stroll after reading. Often one or another of the city's little crannies would arouse a mysterious but powerful emotion inside me. And it seemed that by photographing these locations, I could communicate the wordless awe which had transfixed me.
My parents had given me a camera as a gift, and I take it with me to try to take pictures in various neighborhoods around the city. Of course, when I was a child, I was still unable to grasp the concept that a mere recording of reality on film would not be sufficient to communicate what I felt. To some extent, St. Petersburg still looks like it did in the 19th century. By evoking its eternal themes, water, ice, and the canals, one may approach the soul of the city, giving a more eloquent interpretation of its unique character, what sets it apart from other cities. Gribadov Canal is a popular destination for Petersburgians. It's a place where lovers tend to meet, and it lends itself well to long reveries during the White Nights. This is where I made my most romantic photographs. The ones that are closest to Dostoevsky's short stories and his novel. Crime and Punishment. Есть Настенька, если вы того не знаете. Есть Петербурге довольно странные уголки. В эти места как будто не заглядывает тоже солнце, которое светит для всех петербургских людей, а заглядывает какое-то другое, новое, как будто наручно заказанное для этих углов и светит на все иным особенным светом. Услышите вы, что в этих местах проживают странные люди, мечтатели. In the early 1990s, I was still working on my nomenclature of sign cycle. The series was a criticism of the totalitarian regime and the power of the nomenclatura, but it was no longer relevant to the reality unfolding before our eyes. Gradually, the Soviet regime was crumbling. A severe economic depression had set in. The shelves of the grocery stores were empty, and, as if we were in wartime, food was rationed. To obtain food in exchange for the ration tickets, people would run from one store to another, with a desperate air, their eyes full of sorrow. I'd place my camera at the subway entrance and take photographs. The activity around the station, which was located in a shopping district, overlapped with the sensations I felt when I listened to certain musical compositions. Shostakovich's 13th Symphony in particular, the movement entitled At the Shop. The mass of people flowing around the subway station formed a sort of human tide, giving me a sensation of unrealness, of phantasmagoria. These people were like shadows one would meet in the underworld. I decided to express that feeling in my work, to convey my personal impressions. I had to find a visual metaphor which would enable the viewer to share my feelings as acutely as possible. That is what prompted me to try a long exposure process. Thank mm -hmm. you.
пришла в голову такая мысль, что поскольку... My reasoning was this. Because the passage of time seemed to be stopped in the realm of shadows, one could surely use a camera to stop the passage of time in the eye of the viewer by leaving the aperture open. This is a pensioner, standing at the trolley station waiting for the trolley, and perhaps something else, better days. The trolley makes it possible to express the time that has elapsed. It has come to the station and gone on its way again, and the man is still standing there. The relation to time is quite different from the one in the traditional approach to photography. Insofar as in the history of photography, time is one of the essential components of the act of taking a photograph. That is, photography is the intersection where a certain space meets a certain given moment. There is an encounter between space and time occurring inside the frame. In his case, it is true that time does not exist in terms of a specific instant. You would have to describe it as a portrayal of a duration, of something which is always on the move, and in this case, the photograph is actually a segment of the movement. If we look at the current trends in urban documentary photography, the German school, for example, is characterized by frontality, the use of the view camera, of color. Obviously, Alexei's aesthetic choices are a radical departure from all of that. Also, he is in another dimension as far as temporality is concerned. That is, in a certain way, it is impossible to situate him in a particular time. One cannot say there's a picture of St. Petersburg in 1998, or in the post-Soviet era. His photographs are entirely atemporal, outside of time, and thus unexpected. He captivates many, many people because I think perhaps of this mysterious aspect of his work. Moreover, his attitude and character both have an air of mystery to them. There is something mysterious about him as a person, something that is not withdrawn exactly, but when you are in his presence, you can sense that he is intensely busy. Occasionally, he makes an incursion towards us, but afterwards he withdraws again. There's something about his behavior that exudes mystery. When I reached Haymarket Square, I usually start my stroll through the neighborhood from the point where there is now a commemorative plaque that reads, This was the home of Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky. I took this photograph on the corner of that street. I photographed the view from that angle several times, but once I decided to move the camera slightly while I was taking the picture, and that gave it an altogether remarkable aura, airy and misty, mysterious. The atmosphere of St. Petersburg had always inspired me. I'd always wished to express it in my work, and this is the exact spot where I succeeded in capturing it. During the take, I shifted the camera slightly, which yielded an impression of light suffused with sun.
The texture of the light is the most striking characteristic of this particular work. What he is always striving to capture, I would say, is the presence of a type of light which is quite specific to this city. Photographically, it is exploited in a number of different ways, all of which strive to make the light even more articulate and eloquent. He is definitely this city's photographer. And the thing that always interests me in photography is, how should I say it, the bond that forms between an artist and a particular place. In this case, there is no doubt that the artist and his city are extremely complicit. There are likely to be interesting subjects here, because the market is nearby and there's so much motion and traffic. Since I never know what the final result will be when I'm shooting a scene, sometimes I go home and, after developing the film, study the negatives. Then I return to the same spot and do many more photographic experiments. Sometimes I'll go back to the same place for four or five times, even more. This would be a good shot if the people stand out against the background of the tank, but the woman in white will blend in rather than stand out, and the clothes she's wearing are atypical. It's hard to say. We might try this one, perhaps. There's something about it, it that it's unusual. I do experiments like this with all of the negatives which seem to me to have some potential, somewhere. Then I put them aside. And for a while I don't touch them again. Almost always, the image yielded by the negative is actually only a pale imitation of the impact. The emotion which struck me when I was walking around and paused to give my photographic attention to whatever subject caught my eye. In the case of this woman, I was drawn to her by the paper she was holding, which seemed like a mirror of her soul, flashing like a human cry of despair. When I print the picture, of course I'm striving to focus the viewer's attention on whatever detail attracted me when I took the photograph. If you want a more graphic illustration of how much the documentary proof of the negative differs from the print I am trying to obtain,
we can compare the two. Here is an unreworked print of the negative. And here is one of the many prints I've reworked in an effort to get closer to the feeling I experienced when I was taking the picture. In the case of this photograph, I can see I still have to work on the bleaching and do the toning. One of the main ideas I wanted to bring out in the print is the solitude of this woman. To emphasize that, I wanted to create an atmosphere of confinement around her. The feeling of compassion for this poor woman, thrown out on the street and forced to beg from passers-by, is natural and direct. If compassion is there, then love must also be there. And if love is there, understanding is too. And perhaps that is where one finds one of the objectives of the artist and of art. Basically, Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time is a mirror in which one reads oneself. It enables one to know oneself better, and that is probably the knowledge essential to an artist. To know one's own ideal, one's own dreams, that means one knows one's purpose in life, the goal of one's work. <laughs> 